So piece one of that puzzle is the destruction of Israel and then it'll be justified to impose totalitarianism on Western culture. So that's that's what's going on. We're getting to the final stage here. We're, we're getting to the final moves against the state of Israel. But this has been very long in preparation and the master planner of the whole thing in my model is the small group of people that make state level decisions in the United States. And the historical responsibility that we all have to defend the West with all our energies, because what's at stake is the not only our freedoms and, and liberties, but those of our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, and so on, because the system has now globalized. There's nowhere to run now. If everybody in the West suddenly understands that the whole point of anti-Semitism is to make them slaves, even if they're not Jews, that, that the entire point of the chess play of the anti-Semites that run the world is to make us all slaves, then they will understand that fighting against anti-Semitism is the same thing as your own self-defense. Good people have to win. We have to win. Wow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of Through Conversations podcast, the platform where we explore the truth through conversations with the most brilliant minds. And today we have a guest who's doing that exact work, exploring the truth and telling that truth of what's happening across the world. With me is Francisco Hill White. Francisco, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me again, Alex. It's a pleasure. I'm excited and I know... A lot of our listeners and subscribers are very excited to hear you again because a lot of things, even though we had a two-hour conversation, a lot of things remained uh, unmentioned and unexplored. And today, I'm glad that we can have another chance to do it. And before, we, we spoke six months ago, five months ago almost, and a lot of things have happened since then. And one of those things has that happened is that... Iran has publicly, and of course you've discussed this in your articles on your Management of Reality, of Reality blog and newsletter, but Iran is publicly stating and also now showing, demonstrating that it wants to destroy Israel openly. Now it's not through, of course, you, you'll explore the intricacies with the their, you know, their proxies, wars and everything, but I would like to get your First glance into what's happening with the Iran escalations with Israel right now. Okay, so I think what's important is to remember, though, I mean, though it's true, as you say, that for a lot of people, it's becoming very clear in the last few days that Iran means to destroy the state of Israel. It's not really new. This is not Iran's true intentions coming out into the open. We've known this for a long time. Uh, Iran has been promising to exterminate the Israeli Jews ever since uh, Ayatollah Khomeini took power in 1979. And they do it every month. Uh, they have, you know, state rituals uh, in which they chant death to Israel. This is part of the sort of the official symbolism and ritual life of the Islamic Republic, you know. So it, the intention of Iran to destroy Israel has been clear for a long time to anybody who looks at the Middle East for five minutes uh, because, because of these declarations, which, which are uh, candid statements of their intentions, uh, but also because they've been financing and training and supporting uh, proxy armies to the south and to the north of Israel, the only objective of which, stated by these proxy armies, is the extermination of the Israeli Jews. So, so we've, you know, Iran's intentions have, have been clear for a long time. It's I, the reason why I feel that many of us just realized for the past few days that this is like an open new chapter of the conflict between Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, and of course Iran is that it's the first time that, at least during my lifetime, of course, you're, you're a historian, you are an anthropologist, you're a political analyst, all of these things, you know this perhaps has, has happened beforehand, so you can enlighten us, but it's the first time that I've seen direct missiles being targeted from Iran to Israel. 
And right, but I think I think the way the media has played that up as if it were significant is just one more aspect of the management of reality. Who cares whether Iran, Iran attacks Israel from its own territory or whether Iran attacks Israel from Gaza? Who cares? Or from Lebanon? Those are still missiles that were paid for with Iranian money. Those are still soldiers that have been trained with Iranian technical assistance and supervision and money. Those are still, you know, uh, these, these are armies that are constituted and supported, you know, diplomatically, materially, financially by Iran. They take their orders from Iran and Iran uses them to attack Israel. What is the difference? There is absolutely no difference. So Iran has been at war already with Israel for many years and has been attacking Israel over and over again. The idea that this is somehow excusable or that Iran evades any kind of responsibility for this just because the missiles that are being launched at Israel were previously not being launched from Iranian territory, that's, it makes no difference. Iran has been attacking Israel. A, an Israeli response against Iran, Iran has been justified for a very, very long time. Israel should have done this a long, long time ago. And there is nothing special about the fact that these 300 or so missiles and drones uh, attacked Israel after leaving Iranian soil. That makes no difference at all. So then renewed perspective that I should have and others who should understand about this new uh, situation that just unfolded last week is that on, on recording date is that it's the same story just happened from Iran's government or military rather than throughout he, its proxies, its tentacles, right? Well, I, it's in other words, What's important here is the long-term plan. So, so the long-term plan has been the same ever since Ayatollah Khomeini took power in 1979. So uh, Ayatollah Khomeini is the Iranian cleric who led the Islamic Revolution, who, who deposed the previous ruler, the Shah of Iran, in 1979. And the minute Khomeini took power, he started saying that he was going to exterminate the Israeli Jews. And he said it side by side with Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, because uh, Yasser Arafat is the guy who put Khomeini in power. So Arafat and Abbas together put Khomeini in power because PLO Fatah, what we now call the Palestinian Authority, uh, is the organization that trained and armed Khomeini's guerrillas Uh, in the early 1970s, since the early 1970s, th throughout the 1970s, they were training Khomeini's guerrillas in, in Lebanon, in training camps in Lebanon. And so they both, when, when, the, when Khomeini took power, they, they together, they promised that they would destroy Israel from Tehran, where they were celebrating together the Iranian revolution. Uh, so the long-term plan has always been that. Iran has always been working to move the chess pieces into position so that at some uh, propitious moment, they can attempt to exterminate the Israeli Jews. Anybody who looks at the history of Iran and at the things they say and at the things they have done cannot come to any other conclusion. And it's the very thing that Iranian leaders themselves explain in public that they are doing. They candidly explain in public that they are working, you know, over time to prepare the destruction of Israel. So this Iran has been at war with Israel since 1979. They've been working very hard to destroy Israel. Uh, and uh, the only thing that is happening right now that is different is, or, or new, somewhat new, is that Iran's master plan has matured tremendously. So Iran is now in a position to do way more damage to Israel than it could years ago. 
So now it is beginning to attempt the destruction of Israel. And I believe that uh, it is not just Iran. I think there's a much bigger system here of which Iran is just the the visible face, if you will, uh, in the same way that it worked, you know, during World War II. During World War II, there was a much larger system that was murdering Jews. Uh, in G Nazi Germany was just the the hood ornament, if you will, or, or, or the, that's too, no, that would be to minimize it. But it was, but Nazi Germany was the visible face of a much, much larger movement that was as big as the West. Uh, and that movement was the eugenics movement. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a pan, there was a pan Western alliance of the aristocracies. And they were all interested in, murdering the Jews and enslaving everybody else. And Nazi Germany was, was the thing they created, the thing they financed, the thing they built in order to get that done. But the money and the, and the leadership and the support was coming from all over the West, from the ruling elites all over the West. In the case of Iran, it's a similar structure. So Iran is the visible face of a much larger movement that is not simply as large as the Muslim world. It's much larger. It's the Muslim world and the Western world because it, uh, in the model that, I, uh, that I'm defending, the power elites in the Western world are allied with the Muslim elites, uh, with the Muslim power elites. And together they are building this chessboard uh, that is designed to destroy the Jewish state in a, in a joyous genocide. That's what they're preparing. So this has been going on for years. Uh, if people perceive that there's something new going on, the only thing that's really happening is that the, the, the structure of the system is now achieving uh, the form that it has been looking for all these years. It is succeeding. Uh, and so as the, as the plan matures and the pieces fall into place, uh, but violence against, against Israel is suddenly growing tremendously. My hypothesis for what happened on October 7th mm -hmm. is that the intention was that this would be the final blow. In other words, uh, October 7th, in my view, was intended as the final destruction of Israel. The plan was, because remember, on October 6th, Right before this attack happened, the Israelis were on the brink of a civil war, mm -hmm. it seemed, right? I mean, uh, they were being torn apart uh, by a tremendous national controversy, which had to do with the Supreme Court uh, and other things. I mean, that the, the Supreme Court was, was uh, a, a very sexy issue for people to organize around. But in reality, there were many things that were dividing them. And, um, but, but certainly... Uh, 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 the, the biggest amount of emotion was going into the Supreme Court issue. And many uh, Israeli uh, soldiers and reservists said they would not fight if uh, the political issue they cared about was not resolved the way they wanted, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and people were in the streets and they were loggerheads and it looked like they were on the brink of a civil war. If now, so so remember that's the that's the let's say that's the political backdrop for what happened on October seventh. So I believe that the plan was to take many hostages back to Gaza and then say to the Israeli government, "We will not release these people unless all of the terrorists go out of the Israeli prisons free." And that demand would have split. Uh, would have no I, it's the wrong that's the wrong word that demand would have pushed uh, the Israelis into the civil war that they were already on the brink of okay because half of Israel would have said yes 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 we have to save the hostages and do no matter what to get them back and the other half of Israel would have said never that's the craziest thing possible this will only produce more hostages. We have to stop negotiating with these terrorists. We have to go uh, fight them, blah, blah, blah. And that controversy in a country that was already on the brink of civil war would have tipped them into civil war. Uh, and the minute that civil war had started, would have started, 
they were all going to attack together. Okay, that's my hypothesis. Egypt, uh, uh, Syria, Lebanon, you know, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Iran, everybody, everybody would have attacked at once and it would have been the end of Israel. But I think uh, the the Hamas killers on the ground uh, went off script on October 7th. And I think they went off script because uh, the Israeli population in, in the areas bordering Gaza were so unbelievably unprotected. There was just practically no one there to help them out for many hours and that was how shall i say it it was such a shock to the limbic systems of these killers who who were hungry for jewish you know thirsty for jewish blood you know and so they saw all this jewish meat unprotected and they couldn't control themselves and they went off script and they started torturing even children to death, right? So these these people are have been turned into monsters. So so they couldn't help themselves, and they started massacring people, and it became such a gigantic massacre that the effect on Israelis was to bring them together instead of tipping them into civil war, right? If if things had gone according to script, if they had gone in maybe killed a few Jews, but mainly gotten a lot of hostages back into Gaza and then demanded the release of the terrorists, the political pressure, there wouldn't have been, you know, this unbearable political pressure from Israelis to invade Gaza. You know, you would, you would have gotten this controversy in this civil war. So Israel escaped destruction, in my view, thanks to the fact that these people went off script. And uh, uh, you know, ironically, and and created this this tremendous massacre. So so that's that's what's going on. We're getting to the final stage here. We're we're getting to the final moves against the state of Israel. But this has been very long in preparation, and the master planner of the whole thing in my model uh, is the small group of people that make state level decisions in the United States, or for short the U.S. bosses. Wow. Okay, there's a lot there that I need to unpack, a lot. And I want to I wanna do justice to what you just said and also to try to uncover as much as I can from a lot of things that you covered, which are shocking, of course. And then they resonate in, in a way that uh, disappointingly, it, 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 it disappointingly makes sense. Like, it does make sense, all of these pieces of the well it, yeah. let us put it this way it does fit with the facts whereas the the rival hypothesis the rival model of geopolitics which says that u.s bosses are very interested in protecting the security of israel it 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 has a very hard time explaining you know a, a very big chunk of the evidence so we, we'll get there we'll get there francisco Be, yeah. but before that there's uh, a lot there that I need to unpack. For example, sure. it's, it's, you know, you mentioned that there are so many pieces of the puzzle falling into place. And I'm curious to, I, I want to um, unpack a bit more on what you mean. What are those pieces of the puzzle that are falling into place? More specifically. Oh, okay. So, so uh, some years ago, I began explaining this. I pointed out that the various major interventions of the United States in the Middle East were perfectly consistent with the hypothesis that the United States was helping Iran to be in a better position to destroy Israel. Now, why do I say this? Because the United States has developed a very good relationship uh, with the Lebanese government, which is controlled by Hezbollah. Lebanon is basically Hezbollah. And the U.S. has been collaborating with the Lebanese army, which is controlled by Hezbollah. And they've been sending them weapons. These are U.S. weapons for Hezbollah. Um, 
the U.S. has also been developing a intimate relationship with Qatar. Qatar is a, a jihadi state, major sponsor of jihadi terrorist groups around the world. And major sponsor of Hamas in particular. And yet, it is impossible for the U.S.-Qatari alliance to be more intimate. Uh, the United States has its most important military base in the Middle East in Qatar. And the U.S. is the guarantor of Qatari security because Qatar is impossible to defend. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little peninsula of sand in the Persian Gulf. Uh there's just no way to, to, to defend it. And it is very appetizing to bigger powers because uh, it, it has some of the biggest reserves of gas in the entire world, right? So there's no way Qatar can exist without the U.S., which means that the U.S. government is, has, is in a unique position to influence Qatari foreign policy. But what is Qatari foreign policy? It, they are one of the main financiers of Hamas. So Qatari foreign policy is the destruction of Israel. The, the U.S. bosses give every appearance in their relationship with Qatar to be very happy with that policy, which is also the case uh, when you study their relationship to Lebanon, to the, the official Leban Lebanese government. Um, then... Look at the policies that were very costly that, that, you know, the bill came in at billions and billions of dollars, which is the Gulf War and then the invasion of Iraq. The consequence of those gigantic interventions was that Iraq was completely destroyed. And when Iraq was destroyed, two things happened. Iraq became a nursery, a, a very, very, very uh, fertile nursery for jihadi terrorism, which it wasn't before. With Saddam Hussein, Iraq was perhaps a bad place, or not the best place in the world, I'm sure, because Saddam Hussein was a, a dictator and he could be brutal uh, on, on dissidents and so forth. But... Iraq under Saddam Hussein was not this cauldron of jihadi terrorism uh, where everybody had to fear for their lives. That was not happening. It was a relatively peaceful country. Um, the U.S. intervention turned it into this machine to produce jihadi terrorism and export it elsewhere. That was a consequence of, of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. The other major consequence of the U.S. invasion of Iraq was that Iraq ended up under Ira Iranian control. Okay? Iran ended up controlling Iraq. It still controls it. Now, Iran already controlled Syria and Lebanon. Okay? It has, it has a very tight alliance for a long time with the uh, Assad family that runs Syria, and it controls Lebanon through Hezbollah. So Iraq was the only thing standing between Iran and the borders of Israel, you see. And when the U.S. invasion of Iraq des destroyed Iraq and Iran ended up inheriting Iraq, it also inherited a land corridor to the border of Israel. Now this, I predicted this would happen many years ago. I said, I can see that U.S. foreign policy is going to result in, in Iran having a land corridor all the way to the border of Israel. Now, that's not the kind of thing that an ally of Israel would do. But it is the kind of thing that a hypocritical pretend ally of Israel that in reality wants to destroy Israel would do. Right? 
And now, so when I say that the pieces are falling into place, what I'm saying is that the things I predicted all those years ago have now matured. We, we now have a situation where Iran has a land corridor all the way to Israel. They're supplying Hezbollah through land. They're sending Hezbollah weapons, making it stronger. Uh, Hezbollah is now very, very strong, according to every report I have read. Uh, they have a gigantic army and a lot of hardware, right? This is p- thanks to U.S. Uh, policy. And remember, many of the weapons uh, that had been weapons of the Iraqi army uh, ended up in the hands of ISIS, right? Those are American weapons. So there is a Machiavellian interpretation that says uh, everything came out as it was intended. None of this was a mistake. The way to explain it is to say they are trying to destroy Israel, right? So if you so, so you have two alternative worldviews. One that says everything U.S. bosses did in the Middle East was a series of tremendous mistakes because they have the best interests of, of Israel at heart and are trying to protect Israeli security. It's just that they're 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 incredibly stupid, uh, mostly ignorant about the Middle East. You know, this is a narrative we hear in the media all the time. Uh, and so they find it very difficult to think about what the consequences of their actions in the Middle East will be uh, because they're so naive and, and stupid and ignorant. Um, so that's one hypothesis. And, and what we've seen over the past half century is just a long string of what many analysts believe are obvious mistakes. Right. That's, that, the, the other way to think about this is, no, 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 it, you've, you just got their values wrong. Uh now, why might it, 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 the reason it is attractive to consider that second hypothesis is that the first hypothesis is asking you to believe something that is very implausible. It is asking you to believe that the smart, that the forgive me, that the most powerful people in the world, and I would say the most powerful people in history, because nobody has been able to mobilize as much power as the government of the United States ever in history. Right. So the most powerful people in history are just complete idiots. And and every time they invest billions of dollars in the Middle East, things come out exactly the opposite to what they intended. I, th- I think that's, that's unlikely to be true. I, I think that the most powerful people in the world are probably pretty smart. Uh, why are they so powerful if they're idiots? You know, so they're probably very smart. I mean, after all, they have gigantic bureaucracies that are capturing information all the time. Yodabytes of information and they're uh, cataloging, categorizing this information. They have teams analyzing it, uh, you know, pushing it up the the, the hierarchy to, to have the most rational decision making process possible because they're playing for world power. I mean, when, when you're playing for world power, it is unlikely that you will do things superficially or on a whim uh, uh, or without proper analysis, or that if you're ignorant about the Middle East, you won't rush to correct that uh, with experts who do know about the Middle East. After all, you have all the money. You can just buy the expertise you need. Why wouldn't you do that, right? So it's, it's, it's really quite implausible that the most powerful people in the world are as stupid as the media and academia would have us believe when they routinely explain what has happened in the Middle East for the last half century as a series of endless mistakes. The other thing that's weird about the they make mistakes hypothesis is that these mistakes seem all to go in the exact same direction. So the mistakes always make Iran stronger. And, you know, stupidity, you don't expect that kind of consistency from simple stupidity. Um, Stupidity, you know, is more random. If if you're just making mistakes, why would the mistakes always go in the same direction and achieve qualitatively the same result, which is to make Iran stronger? That's, That's very strange. The probability of that is very low. So I think we, we should consider the, the Machiavellian hypothesis. 
that says that everything that U.S. bosses have been doing in the Middle East, which has been progressively weakening the security of the Israeli state, is precisely what they intend. And as you mentioned, some of the things that have happened very recently are so dramatic that some people are suddenly saying, oh, this is new. The U.S. seems to be against Israel. What's going on? No, 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 no. You just weren't paying that much attention before. And some of the behaviors weren't as dramatic as these. And uh, the media was careful to give you an interpretation that before October 7th, when you weren't so scared uh, and, and you weren't paying this much attention, were sufficient to keep you more or less asleep. But now that's harder because after October 7th, uh, anything less than full support for Israeli retaliation uh, becomes obviously a, a, a kind of betrayal of what the relationship between the United States and Israel was supposed to be. So a lot of people are kind of uh, waking up to this situation now. But the structure was always the same. It's just that people were not paying attention or were not scared enough. I'll give you an example. Uh, immediately after Ayatollah Khomeini, and this is not simply an example, this is, I think, a dramatic fact that cannot be explained with the we make mistakes hypothesis. Uh, I th this, this is a fact, this is what I call a dramatic fact, which is therefore impossible under the non Machiavellian hypothesis. And it is this immediately after Ayatollah Khomeini took power in Iran, in, Iran, in, in 1979. Ronald Reagan took power in the United States. Okay? Uh, and it was right after Ronald Reagan was inaugurated that the CIA started sending billions of dollars in armament secretly to Ayatollah Khomeini, to the, to the thug who founded the Islamic Republic as a theocratic jihadi terrorist regime that promised not only to destroy Israel, but the United States. Reagan sent billions of dollars in armament to that guy, right? So the question is, what's going on? That, that's an ally of Israel. This is the guy that immediately after taking power started promising that he would exterminate the Israeli Jews. So Reagan the guy who campaigned endlessly on the issue of, you know, I'm going to be very tough with Iran because his whole presidential campaign was about that, right? He, he wins the election, and the first thing he does is he starts sending secretly billions of dollars in weapons to Iran, to the state that wants to exterminate the Israeli Jews. Now, when they caught him, it, this was in 1986, this scandal went public. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan said, oh, yeah, sorry, we shouldn't have done that. But uh, it's just that, you know, Hezbollah had taken seven American citizens hostage in Lebanon. And since Ayatollah Khomeini is the creator of Hezbollah, we thought, you know, we'll, we'll send him weapons to see if that softens him up, you know, and, and, and that way we can beg him to lean on Hezbollah to release those seven American hostages. Right? Most ridiculous explanation ever. Absurd on principle. Uh, in principle, forgive me. But but it couldn't even be true. There was no material way this could be true because as, as uh, historians are fond of saying, uh, chronology is the backbone of historiography. Because if you don't know what happened first and what happened next and what happened last, you can't possibly... Uh, have any way of testing your hypotheses of causality, right? So uh, Reagan says, yeah, 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 we, we, we're sorry we did that. We're sorry we sent all those weapons to, to Khomeini, but we, we, we meant well. We meant well. We're just idiots, you know? This is the story they keep recirculating, that they're idiots. He says, we, we meant well uh, because what we were trying to do was free some hostages in Lebanon. Okay. Can't be true. Because the first hostage in Lebanon was taken in 1982. And the secret weapons to Khomeini started flowing in 1981. So the decision to start sending weapons to Khomeini had nothing to do with hostages. Wow. And what about PLO Fatah? 
PLO Fatah, as we were saying earlier in this interview, is the creator of Khomeini. They are the ones that put Khomeini in power in Iran. So what is PLO Fatah doing inside Israel? PLO Fatah is, is Iran. Yeah, you were going to ask me that, I know, because that's, that's obviously the next question, right? What are they doing in Israel? If PLO Fatah is, is the organization that trained and armed the guerrillas that fought the Iranian Islamic Revolution, that put Ayatollah Khomeini in power, Khomeini, who, who has dedicated Iran to the destruction of the Jewish state, well, in that case, what is PLO Fatah doing inside the Israeli state? What is PLO, and I'll tell you what it's doing there. U.S. bosses forced Israel to let them in. It's called the Oslo peace process. Yeah. Now, this is, again, this is what I call a dramatic fact. Putting PLO Fatah inside Israel to govern the Arab Muslims who live in the stri militarily strategic territories of Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, that is impossible under the hypothesis that the U.S. is trying to protect Israeli security. It's not just unlikely. It's not surprising. It's impossible. If the U.S. bosses were trying to protect Israeli security, the last thing, the last thing they would have ever done is create a diplomatic process, force Israel to participate, and then threaten Israel until it, it bent the knee, right, and accepted this organization into strategic territory of the Jewish state. That's the last thing U.S. bosses would have done if they were trying to protect the security of the Israeli state. The last thing. It's impossible under the we are allies hypothesis. So the fact that they did it is by itself entirely sufficient to refute the hypothesis that U.S. bosses are on the side of Israel. And as, as we were saying, there's a mountain of evidence to suggest uh, not just the fact that they put PLO Fatah inside Israel, although that, that's plenty, uh, it, it's entirely sufficient. But around that fact, there is this whole other constellation of facts, all of them consistent with the hypothesis that uh, U.S. bosses are masterminding the Iranian destruction of the Israeli Jews. And what, what is most interesting from the point of view of analytical uh, scientific history, historiography, is that the exact same structure, and we have this documented on, on management of reality, the exact same structure operated in World War II. Okay? The, the German Nazis were apprentices of the U.S. eugenicists. Yep. So the, the, the great, great industrialists in the United States, the great monopolists, people like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, uh, what's his name, Watson at IBM, and, and other industrialists, uh, top industrialists, were leaders of the eugenics movement. In the eugen and they controlled the U.S. government. I mean, uh, uh, Roosevelt was put in the White House by by Rockefeller, working out of the uh, Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, this is no secret to historians of of, uh, uh, of of the politics of that time. And uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Ford, Watson, and, and and some others were pouring billions of dollars into making eugenics mainstream. Yeah. And, yeah. Eugenics courses, thanks to their money, were taught in in uh, secondary and and, and uh, university education all over the United States. And laws were passed. Law, eugenics laws were passed in the United States uh, that had the consequence that hundreds of thousands of U.S. citizens were either forcibly sterilized or incarcerated mm -hmm. or unmarried by state officials. Uh, for not having sufficient Germanic blood, uh, because that was the the eugenics ideology, yep. uh, and they were doing this with phony IQ tests and so forth. Uh, so all of that was happening, and at the same time, these same industrialists were sending money to Germany 
uh, and that money turned the German eugenics movement into German Nazism. So we have the same structure. We have uh, the U.S. bosses fueling a movement that will be the public face of the destruction of the Jews. You know, in, in the case of World War II, we're talking about the European Jews. And in the present case, it's happening in the Middle East, and Iran is going to be the public face of the destruction of the Israeli Jews. But in both cases, the mastermind, the, the puppeteer, is in Langley, Virginia. That will, for, for people who don't know, Langley, Virginia is where the CIA has its headquarters. Francisco, so I have a question here. Of course, many questions. Just This one is the, the one that's making me the most confused, which is we've saw sure. after, of course, if we're going to go back all the way to World War II, uh, the United States defeated the Nazi Germany. So that's one thing. And well, no, that's not true. That's not true. Okay. That's what they teach you. That's what they teach you in school. But that's not what, what is documented. Uh, people in, in this, and because people believe what you just said, Uh, everything I say is very surprising. People are like, well, wait a minute. How could U.S. bosses have been uh, creating the German Nazi movement when they were obviously enemies of the German Nazi movement because they went to Europe to fight the Nazis and defeated the Nazis? This is the story that people have in their heads. And Israel also was uh, strongly supported by the United States after World War II. No, that's also false. That's also false, so, right? So, so the, why, these are. I have like so much noise in my in my mind because those two right. ideas. I've I've grown with those ideas, and also last week, just last week, we saw just one example of how, quote unquote, I'm putting quote unquote now because of what you just are describing right now, but the support of Israel in terms of also uh, aid, billions and billions right. of dollars directly to aid. So right, right, right. So this, so. This is the whole confusion that I have. Okay, so. I have found that that it, it is useful to to think about these things in terms of metaphors, uh, because metaphors are uh, and metaphors that have to do with personal relationships. Because personal relationships, the, the the human brain is very highly adapted to think about personal relationships. Because for for uh, you know. Right, Well, I was going to say two million years, but more than two million years, because even our prehominent ancestors uh, were living as foragers, right? So the human lineage has spent so much time living as foragers in very tiny societies um, where everybody knows everybody, right? That thinking about human relationships is something that we do very well. We do it very naturally. Geopolitics is a lot harder for us. And it is especially harder because the information environment in which we have to reason about geopolitical reality is is a managed space. Information is being managed for us. Uh, and we are being told lots of lies. We are giving constantly given interpretations that sound authoritative, uh, but that don't explain the data, right? But they keep being repeated over and over again as, as if this was the only hypothesis we could have about what's going on. Uh, and so that befogs our mind. It makes it very difficult to think about geopolitics. But thinking about personal relationships, we can do that fine. So here's the metaphor that I think works here. Imagine that we're talking about a lady that was murdered. And we have the video of the guy who murdered her. Uh, so we know who it was. There's no ambiguity there. It was this guy, John Doe. And in the video, you can see John Doe Stabbing this woman in the heart 17 times, you know. Um, so suppose that that's not the only evidence we have. Suppose that uh, we also know from various independent lines of confirming evidence that in the weeks before the murder, this guy, John Doe, had been doing all kinds of things that seemed paradox slightly paradoxical, at least. Uh, in light of the murder, he had been bringing this woman flowers. He took her to, you know, to to dinner. Uh, they went to a museum together, etc. Suppose that after the murder, somebody tells you, we shouldn't consider this man an enemy of this woman. Because look, he brought her flowers. 
that would sound to us like a ridiculous argument. And we would say, we, we would reply something like, what are you talking about? He murdered her. Obviously, the fact that he brought her flowers cannot be weighted more, more uh, cannot have greater weight in our evaluation of the true intentions of this guy than the fact that he stabbed her 17 times in the heart. True, the two events appear contradictory. Bringing her flowers is affiliative, whereas murdering her is the opposite, right? So the, the, two, the two events seem contradictory. But, but you can't resolve the apparent contradiction by saying he's her friend because the hypothesis he's her friend makes it impossible that he will murder her, you see? So then you have to find some, some interpretation that will make sense of all the data. So one interpretation would be, well, he, he was trying to get something from her, uh, he wanted to murder her for, for some reason. We, we can investigate which. And the, the befriending her and, and, and uh, you know, taking her out and going to the museum, bringing her flowers, was the way for him to establish a trust relationship. You know, she, she, he wanted her to trust him so that he could then be in a position to murder her easily and then maybe dispose of the body or whatever, right? So then you have a model that says it all makes sense. What appeared to be a contradiction can in fact be explained as part of a Machiavellian, forgive me, Machiavellian uh, uh, plan mm -hmm. in which this man secured this woman's trust and then was able to put her in a position where he could murder her, right? Okay, so that's easy to understand. When we're talking about geopolitics, what the media are telling you about all the time are the things that the United States bosses do that seem like they're nice things for Israel. So right now, a lot of people are getting confused because the U.S. Congress just approved, uh, you know, I, I think something like $95 billion, uh, although it's not all for Israel. Some of it is for Ukraine. Some of it is for whatever. Mm -hmm. And some of it is for Israel. 60 billion right, whatever. Billion. Right. So it's not all for Israel, but it, whatever. So some money was approved for Israel, mm -hmm. right? And so that... It gets saturation coverage in the news and people start asking me, you know, because because I get people asking me on what's happened. They say, hey, Francisco, what's going on? So it, doesn't this mean that the U.S. is actually, you know, supporting Israel? Doesn't this mean the U.S. bosses are helping Israel? Right. And it's the it's the same thing. I mean, we already watched the guy murder the lady. So why are you asking me whether the fact that he brought her flowers last week means that he's he's the lady's friend? Why, why are we having this conversation? He already stabbed her 17 times. This is the value of establishing the relationship between Pilo Fatah and Iran. Because the U.S. already forced Israel to accept Pilo Fatah, which is to say Iran, to govern Arab Muslims in strategic, mil militarily strategic territory of the Jewish state. In other words, the U.S. already stabbed Israel in the heart. Given that the U.S. already stabbed Israel in the heart, the other behaviors which seem like, oh, like friendship, like U.S. friendship towards Israel, those need to be evaluated from the point of view of the Machiavellian hypothesis because the stabbing in the heart already happened. So the, what, what is the obvious hypothesis here? Oh, well, U.S. bosses need millions of people to think that they are supporting Israel. And that those millions of people will not be convinced unless some actual money changes hands. I mean, because you can only, you know, just just saying I support Israel is not going to be very convincing if you don't do anything, right? So in order to convince millions of people, first of all, U.S. citizens, mm -hmm. that U.S. bosses are supporting Israel, some some behaviors that are convincingly in the category of friendship have to be expressed or nobody will be convinced, right? And one of those behaviors is we give some money to Israel. Another of those behaviors is we give some weapons to Israel. And this becomes very convincing to a lot of people. But you see, what nobody does, because nobody thinks that they need to go check, what nobody does is perform the algebraic sum where you 
subtract from all the support that Israel gets from the U.S., let's say, in weapons, the support that the mortal enemies of Israel get from the U.S. When you do that, it comes out negative for Israel. But nobody bothers to perform this algebraic sum. So just to give you a couple of pointers here. I was mentioning earlier that the U.S. government has been sending weapons, U.S. weapons, to the Lebanese army, which means that it's sending U.S. weapons to Hezbollah. Okay? It is public that one month before the Hamas attack from Gaza against Israel, against Israeli civilians, the U.S. freed $6 billion for Iran. It is public that after the Israeli offensive against Hamas in Gaza began, the U.S. sent $100 million to Hamas. That's all public. It is also public that uh, the country that gets the most U.S. weapons of any country on the planet is Saudi Arabia, mortal enemy of Israel. And we know from history, because they got caught in the 1980s, that the U.S. sends secret weapons to Iran. But I'm not finished. Egypt signed a piece of paper uh, in 1979 uh, with with Israel. This is the Sadat Begin Treaty, um, negotiated at Camp David David, under Jimmy Carter's auspices. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Egypt signed a piece of paper that said, we will not try to exterminate the Israeli Jews again, basically, right? And in exchange for saying that and putting their signature on that piece of paper, the U.S. sends to Egypt two-thirds of what it gives to Israel every year. More or less two-thirds. I mean, the numbers year to year may change. but And Egypt spends all of that money on military hardware, all of it, every penny. So when when you, okay, true, the U.S. sends sends a few weapons, some weapons and and money to Israel, but it doesn't send more than what it sends to the combined enemies of Israel. No, the combined mortal enemies of Israel, who in fact surround Israel and are inside Israel, thanks to U.S. policy, those guys combined get way more than what Israel gets. Oh, and I forgot to mention, Pilo Fatah. Uh, Pilo Fatah, which is Iran inside Israel, their uh, paramilitary and military forces and police forces were trained by the CIA. Okay? So, you know, after the Oslo Agreement, this was this is public. You know, because the, the Oslo Agreement cleaned up the prestige of Pilo Fatah uh, because now they were supposedly the peace partner for Israel. And so it under the framework of that diplomatic circus, the U.S. could, could say, oh, well, we need to train Pilo Fatah to be a proper police force. Isn't that a beautiful narrative? So, so the CIA went in and trained uh, Pilo Fatah's terrorists because that's what they are. Oof. So it's confusing for me. And I think that also for for perhaps for our listeners will be is that why would the, the United States and I would love for you to to maybe expand upon who are these final who are these U.S. bosses, but how, why do they need to convince us that they are supporting Israel? Why not just you know back off and just allow things to to happen? Why do U.S. bosses need to convince us that they're friends of Israel? Mm -hmm. Oh, because U.S. bosses are not all powerful. People forget that. Every time people talk to me about my conspiracy theories, uh, they, they keep sliding into the position where my theories require that U.S. bosses are all powerful. I, I don't think they're all powerful. 
I think they have constraints. There are things they can't do. Uh, why? Because their job number one for the people who run the world is staying in power. In order to stay in power, you need to avoid revolution. In order to avoid revolution, you have to be careful not to piss off most of the population. Now, if most of the U.S. citizens, if most of U.S. citizens believe that their own bosses, that the people running the United States are totalitarians who are trying to enslave them, if they, if they believe that, then there would be a revolution in the United States and the bosses would lose power because U.S. citizens, most of them, don't want to be slaves. Right? This, this, is, this is one of the countries that invented modern freedom. Not the only one, like they think, but it is one of the countries that invented modern freedom. So uh, if, if most U.S. citizens become convinced that they're that the people running their lives are in secret totalitarians who are trying to create something more like Nazi Germany in the United States, right? And, and, and are going to enslave them or the Soviet Union or something like that. Um, then the U S bosses will not securely hold power. Therefore they manage reality so that it will appear that they are trying to protect democracy. This is precisely why, the media system and the academic system are always telling people that when U.S. policy in the Middle East has the consequence that jihadi Islamism extremism gets worse, which is always what happens, that this is a mistake, that this is not what they intended. They were trying to do the opposite. They were trying to free Iraq. They were trying to build democracy in Iraq. It just went all terribly wrong because they're idiots, right? This is why they have to push that interpretation because if they're not idiots, if they're geniuses, then their values are the opposite of our values because we don't want jihadi uh, uh, extremism to grow. We don't want to live in a Sharia state that is totalitarian and that turns us all into slaves, right? So, um, it, it, this is the precise reason why the interpretation that they're, you know, they're, they're bumbling fools. Jared Israel used to call this the bumbling bear uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, the, 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 the representation of U.S. intelligence as this bumbling bear that can never get anything right is always, you know, uh, uh, like, like an elephant in a china shop, you know, uh, uh, moving around and destroying everything because it doesn't, it, it, it has no subtlety and no understanding and so forth. This is the interpretation they need you to have in your head because the alternative is that they're trying to enslave you. So here's, here's what, let's go back to, to the beginnings of our conversation where you said that we're entering the final stages of quote unquote, the destruction of Israel and we're in the final blow of everything. And I think, well, I think October 7th was the final blow. We got lucky. And so well, we got lucky is a hor horrible way of saying it because what happened on October 7th was, was, uh, was so, so unbelievably horrific. But, but uh, if you compare that to the entire population of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, all, all of whom might have been destroyed if the plan had gone, uh, if, if everything had gone according to plan, then in one sense, of course, we did get lucky, right? And so that, that, that also, it's, it's interesting because we, we read, of, of course, management of reality. <laughs> you, you probably want to say it's part of the plan. But we also read that Iran wasn't aware that Hamas was going to... I'm sorry, I didn't, understand, I didn't understand your point about management of reality. No, because I read it in the news. I, it, I, you know, it was managed by, by someone else, my reality. I read... That. Oh, no, no I, remember, I'm not saying that everything you read in the news is false. Uh, it, it, it would never, you know, a system to manage our reality could never work if everything they said was false, because it would be obvious after a while that everything they're saying is false and they could never manipulate us. So they, they lie to you. They lie to us in very important ways. This is true, but they have to be doing it against the background of, uh, you know, mostly factual reporting. Um, so it's, it's on, on key things that they lie to us. So what is this item that you were worried might be false? What is it that they said? So it, it was said that it was, perhaps it was said this way, 
because it, the plan failed, but it was reported that Iran wasn't aware that Hamas didn't tell Iran that they were going to attack. So they, they just went ahead and attacked. Perhaps this interpretation or, or this statement was because the, pla the plan failed. If it would have succeeded, then perhaps they would have taken credit. But well, that makes some, some sense. Uh, where, where, so who said that Hamas had not told uh, Iran about the attack? I'll send you. I'll send you the the link. I'll send you links after. Okay. Good. And yes, this is this is the, so. What you're demonstrating. Uh, this was wonderful. So, so glad you said this because what you what you're demonstrating is how once you start owning this model, this Machiavellian model that I'm I'm selling, that teaches you to be skeptical about specific items of information. Right? You're like, well, I wonder if this is really true or whether. They said this to cover what they're really doing, right? Having a having the, this Machiavellian model allows you to ask those questions, which is which is what you're doing, and it's productive because then you can start testing the model. So you can you can go and investigate and try to see if you can find out if there's any solid evidence that this is true, or maybe there's a contradiction. Maybe the opposite was reported first, and then they started saying this because they did. They realized, oh, wait, wait, we shouldn't be telling them that they were coordinated and they changed because that happens too. And when you when you go look at the sequence of reporting in the archives of of big media, sometimes you find this, that that they were saying one thing and then suddenly boop, they start saying the opposite and then they just keep going. Uh, and because people never think that they need to check for this kind of thing, uh, this works. And, and, and after a little while, nobody remembers that in the beginning they had been saying exactly the opposite of what they're now saying. And of course, this is also like, this could be easily debunked because uh, last week we saw the attack from Iran to Israel, which was a consequence of, you know, Israel targeting, I think it was two high command officers from Iran. And they were... They I think it was a total of eight people that they got. Eight, eight people. Yeah. I think so. Wrong. Yeah, so... It, of course, it was known by Iran because Iran helped orchestrate the October 7th attacks. So it all makes sense now because it, why would Israel attack, you know, Iran commanders uh, last week or two weeks ago? Well, of course. I mean, if if Iran attacks Israel, which is what happened on October 7th, mm -hmm. that was an attack by Iran. Mm -hmm. um, and it is an attack by Iran regardless yeah. of whether... Hamas did or did not tell Iran first on October 7th. That doesn't matter. So even, even under the interpretation where uh, Hamas, uh, you know, uh, jumped the gun on October 7th and launched an attack without permission from Iran, it's still an Iranian at attack because Iran has been creating that army. They have been training that army. They have been arming them. They have been advising them. They have been giving them technical assistance. Uh, uh, they have been training some Hamas fighters in Iran, etc. So it's it's an Iranian attack, whether or not uh, the order for October seventh came from Tehran. Right. Okay, let's very, let's be very clear about that. And so uh, uh, an Israeli response against Iran was completely justified, no question. Yeah, yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. And of course, you know, listening to you makes more sense. But I'm still concerned because you know in the beginning of the conversation you again you mentioned that the final blow was october 7th and we quote unquote uh we we you know dodged a major bullet on you know even it was still a tragedy and one that we can't really recover from yet but you also mentioned that we're in the final stages of the destruction or quote unquote the attack on israel and how Again, I, I don't want to go back into the pieces of the puzzle coming together because you, you also covered that. But how are all, you know, how, how is this culminating and how will this culminate if we're in the ending stages of all this process, of all the process of, you know, trying to destabilize Israel? And oh, it's going to culminate with the extermination of the Israeli Jews. That's what's coming. Obviously, obviously. Look, uh, People look at me and, you know, and their eyes come out of their sockets when I say this. And, and then I tell them, look, what, don't, don't act so surprised. Uh, I am only predicting that what happens every century will happen also this century. I mean, the, the, 
least risky prediction that a historian can make about the 21st century is that the most stable sociological process of Western civilization, which is the mass killing of Jews, will happen again in the 21st century as it has happened almost every century before it for 2,500 years. It's not a risky prediction to say that what always happens is going to happen again. If I say that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, is that a risky prediction? No. And it's not risky to say that in the 21st century, there will be an anti-Jewish genocide. There's no risk in that prediction. It happens every century. So what do I think is going to happen? An anti-Jewish genocide. But the pieces are already in place. I've been warning about this for many years. But only after October 7th did I really start getting a lot of people listening to me. But my, my book published in, in uh, 2013, uh, the title of that book is The Collapse of the West, The Next Holocaust and Its Consequences. And I made a very clear prediction about what was going to happen in Israel. I didn't know exactly when. Uh, people started getting upset with me when, when uh, you know, a few years went by and Israel was still standing. And I was like, well, well wait a minute. I, the one thing I can't do is say exactly when they're going to do it because I don't have access to their planning meetings. Uh, but but the, the system I am describing is perfectly clear. If, if you emancipate yourself from the interpretations you keep hearing in the media uh, and in academia, and just look at the facts of where the U.S. spends its money and where it dedicates its diplomatic and military muscle. Uh, uh, it's, it's perfectly clear where this is going. Uh, so, so there's nothing strange about this prediction. It's just that our reality is so carefully managed that it is possible for the bosses of the system to convince us that the most obvious things are surprising and vice versa. So I think that the reason why I feel that uh, prediction is is risky is not because uh, of it being far fetched is because of of the consequences the, comp the you know the, the the consequences of it happening you know it's no one really that doesn't make that doesn't make the prediction risky so so the, the prediction has doesn't have the power to produce the result to the contrary making the prediction and making millions of people aware of the prediction and making them aware of what's behind the prediction, how the model works, and what the evidence is that supports it, that has the potential to stop the next Holocaust. And uh, right, so so the prediction the prediction has no power to produce the next Holocaust. To the contrary, the more people know this prediction, the less likely the Holocaust becomes, because U.S. bosses need us not to understand what they're about to do uh, in order to get away with it. So, so that's one thing, but the, but the, but the hypothesis itself is not risky at all in terms of, uh, being a far-fetched hypothesis. You said it yourself. It's not far-fetched. It happens every century. Yeah. Also, I also feel that, you know, perhaps this is also something that I need to, to, uh, rethink and, and, you know, uh, reflect on is that I feel that the state of Israel and, and Israelis and Jewish people are stronger now than they were before in terms of, of defense capabilities. They, they're able to at least somehow uh, try to, to prevent that from happening themselves. Powerful army, a military. Well, I think I, th this, is, this is a counter argument that I have been hearing for many years, ever since I started making my prediction that a new Holocaust was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with this counter argument is that uh, October 7th demonstrated that the state of Israel could not protect, protect all the civilians that were tortured to death and taken hostage. So, I mean, the demonstration of Israeli weakness is already patently on the table. And didn't the, the uh, you know, the attacks on Iran right now, what, last week rather, uh, that they weren't able to track them uh, you know the missiles and these airstrikes from Israel. Aren't they a good sign that we're that, that Israel is on a good uh, place to defend itself? The Iron no, Dome, all of those. I don't think so. No, no, because uh, it's it's an illusion. It's it. I mean, it's, I think the, I think those systems are really good uh, in terms of achieving the result of giving Israelis of, and Jews of the diaspora a false sense of confidence. I think that's what they achieve. And I think that's what they're mostly for. 
because um, first of all, uh, Iran has way more missiles and drones than were launched at Israel uh, the other day. Way more. So, sure, Israeli defenses dealt with this attack rather well, but this was not really the attack designed to test whether Israeli defenses could be breached. To the contrary, this attack was calibrated to be within the range of attacks that Israeli defenses can handle. And in fact, it was it is public uh, that Iranian and U.S. officials were exchanging messages so that the Iranian attack would not be so big that it would create damage and therefore cause the Israeli population to pressure the Israeli government irresistibly to launch a big counterattack against Iran. This was all calibrated and agreed upon. The mobilization of U.S. forces to the Middle East was not to defend Israel. It was the, the, to give the appearance of defending Israel, yes. But the real reason they were mobilized was to make sure that the, the, the different actors that might be destroyed by a sufficiently large Israeli retaliation did not provoke Israel into that response. Because if that had happened, then they would lose some of the pieces that they need on the chessboard for the future destruction of Israel. So what they're protecting is that system that, they're, that they've built. And it all becomes very obvious when you see that the, the U.S. bosses publicly said that they were against any Israeli response against Iran. Iran, the state that we all know, is building a nuclear bomb. Why wouldn't you want the... Infrastru the military infrastructure of Iran to be utterly destroyed if you were really a friend of Israel who's trying to protect Israeli security. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's your real position, then you want the entire military infrastructure of Iran to be destroyed because Iran is run by jihadi terrorists who find it acceptable to have lots of Muslims murdered in a nuclear exchange with Israel so long as that nuclear exchange exterminates the Israeli Jewish population. This is something that Hashemi Rafsanjani said in public. And Rafsanjani, Ayatollah Rafsanjani, is the founder of the Iranian nuclear program. So if you're a friend of Israel, you want a very strong Israeli response, and you help Israel to do it, and you destroy completely Iran's uh, uh, entire military infrastructure. But if what you want is for that military infrastructure to survive and to finish creating a bomb that is going to be dropped on Israel, then you would do exactly what the U.S. bosses did, which is to say, we will have nothing to do with an Iranian, I'm sorry, with an Israeli response against Iran, and we're against it, and we're, adv we're advising Israel not to do it, and uh, w there will be no support for Israel if they do it, you know, this kind of thing. Come on. It's obvious what's going on. It's obvious. If they would have allowed, uh, like you said, if they would have allowed an all-out attack towards Iranian infrastructure, nuclear infrastructure, and, and all of the military infrastructure, and I, what I mean is the United States, of course, wouldn't you say that that, wouldn't ha that would have unleashed World War III and then, you know, the complete destruction of you know, everything? Or that would have just, and, of, and by everything else, I mean their plans, you know, their plans of control, everything would have gone to... To see to... Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that the label World War III is terribly useful. Um, people imagine World War III as being an event where the professional armies of the, of the states of the world are all mobilized at the same time and everybody takes sides and there's a gigantic conflict all over the planet. Mm -hmm. um, that may or may not happen, but I don't think that's important. Well, I mean, of course it's important. Let's hope it doesn't happen. But my point is, it's it's not important to the prediction of whether Israel is going to be destroyed. So the, the, what these people are trying to do, in my view, is destroy Israel and then impose totalitarian oppression on all Westerners and therefore on the, on the entire planet. So piece one of that puzzle is the destruction of Israel and then... It'll be justified to impose totalitarianism on 
Western culture, Western society? So this is this would be my prediction. After after the jihadi destruction of Israel, after the great next Holocaust, everybody will be momentarily shocked and utterly frightened in the West by jihadi terrorism. So even though they, many of these people are anti-Semites, the genocide itself and the public declarations of these jihadi Muslims, which I can tell you right now are going to be, we're coming, we're coming for you next. They're coming for us. They're going to say it. They're proud of it. They're saying it now. They're saying it already, right? So the, the genocide of the Israeli Jews is going to scare Westerners. And when that happens, Western bosses are going to say to Western citizenries, we have to protect you from these crazy jihadists. And they're everywhere now. There's many jihadi Muslims living in the West. We have to find them. We have to defang their organizations. And, and the only way we can do that is to remove all of your remaining rights and liberties. Because we need to be able to spy on everyone and arrest people without warrant and torture prisoners and blah, blah, blah. And all of our rights are going to disappear under the excuse that they are at war with this jihadi terrorism that they created themselves. That's what they wanted to do in World War II, in my opinion. They wanted the Nazis to establish an, a European empire. And then they would have said to the Americans, to the U.S. citizens, they would have said, and to Europeans, well, Europeans would have been under the Nazi empire. And to Americans, they would have said, uh, we can't protect you from the Nazi empire unless you give us more powers. We, we need state of emergency powers. And then all of our rights and liberties would have disappeared. It's more or less what they did do after World War II, using the Soviet Union as an excuse. So they, they said to U.S. citizens, look, the Soviet Union is very powerful. We have communist spies everywhere. They're crawling everywhere. We have to find them. And so we have to, we have to suspend your rights and liberties. And, the, and that was called McCarthyism. And it was a gigantic persecution where everybody was under suspicion of being a secret communist. And anybody could accuse you of being a communist. And then you were hauled up before some, uh, some tribunal that would examine your previous uh, thoughts and sayings or whatever, or alleged thoughts and sayings and, and, and publications and memberships and so on. Um, and there was this gigantic persecution it, it, it basically ended freedom in the United States and domesticated U.S. citizens. It was very powerful. McCarthyism was a powerful event. So I, if, if the Nazis had succeeded in creating a European empire, which is what, what I believe the intention of these eugenicists was, uh, then uh, they would have used the Nazi threat uh, to remove all liberties from U.S. citizens. But remember, they had created the Nazis, right? That, that's what the Nazis were for. Then the, the whole point of creating the Nazis was to use a tool that would seem like it's not you, that uh, is employed to destroy modern democratic freedoms and install totalitarianism over the entire surface of the West. Do you think, Francisco, that that plan in itself is closer to fruition right now than it was back in World War II? What I mean by that is, and if, I, if I'm explaining myself, do you think this time around, the, fine, the U.S. bosses, which uh, were orchestrating everything in World War II, will succeed in doing that, you know, that system of, of, of the world, of totalitarianism? So, well, I think, I think the answer to your question has to be a conditional. So let's, let's just run a hypothetical thought experiment in our heads. Suppose this particular interview in which uh, the, the consequences of the plan coming to complete fruition have been explained. Mm -hmm. 
uh, assuming that we did a good job and that it's relatively clear and so forth. Suppose that this interview tomorrow has, I don't know, 80 million views and, and everybody starts uh, sharing it. And in the blink of an eye, uh, millions and millions of Westerners understand what is going on. They start checking the facts. They talk to each other. They, they conclude that, that this model is, is uh, uh, predictive enough that it should be taken seriously and that probably uh, our Western bosses are colluding to enslave us all, right? If that happens, then I believe that Israel won't be destroyed and the West will not collapse. Because in order to achieve their plans, the bosses need the giant bureaucracies that they control to do what they need them to do, right? Because that's how they move the world. They move the world by giving orders to these gigantic bureaucracies that employ many, 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 many people. These are bureaucracies, both public and private. Uh, and... Most of the people who work in those bureaucracies are not evil. They don't want to commit genocide. They're not interested in destroying all of our Western democratic rights and freedoms. Uh, they just don't understand the system they're working for. Right? But if, if they all of a sudden do understand it, if these millions of uh, professional Westerners who are necessary for the entire system to operate were to become enlightened about the direction of the system and the intentions of U.S. bosses and were to understand that they are about to be enslaved and that the key event to build to that consequence is the destruction of Israel, then they would stop cooperating with their bosses and the system stops this is why the bosses manage reality they need us not to understand what they're doing because they know that if we understand what they're doing we will not cooperate with it we want to live in peace we want to uh, uh, get along with each other we want to have our democratic rights and freedoms we don't want totalitarian oppression we don't want to be slaves obviously nobody wants to be a slave so uh, if, if, if the great mass of modern Westerners can suddenly understand what is going on, the system stops. So, so the answer to your question is a conditional. Now, if that doesn't happen, if this interview is in, in, incoherent to most people, it, it, it cannot be understood what we're saying, uh, uh, the, the model is not convincing, uh, people go and check our facts and it turns out that, that, uh, uh, it, it, they, they can't, it's not sufficient for them to emancipate themselves from how reality is, is being managed or, or we don't reach a sufficient number of people in, in, a, in, in the time we, ha we have left and so forth. Well, then the answer to your question is, this is all going to happen. Uh, so it's a conditional and it, and, it, and it depends on the speed at which the podcast revolution can channel to millions of Westerners, the key information they need to understand their current predicament and the historical responsibility that we all have to defend the West with all our energies. Because what's at stake is the not only our freedoms and, and liberties, but those of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and so on. Because the system has now globalized. There's nowhere to run now. You can't escape to some other corner of the earth and make a republic there. It's one globalized system now. So, you know, good people have to win. We have to win. Because very soon it's going to be way game over one way or the other. Either the, the planet becomes a, a free planet uh, that protects uh, ordinary people everywhere and, 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 and gives rights and liberties to everyone. Or we become a planetary totalitarian nightmare uh, that is going to look a lot more like North Korea and China in just a few years. Well, listen, Francisco, I, I, I dare to say that this conversation, even though it's it's uh, <laughs> it, you know it's shocking, it's a it's a shocking conversation, at least for me. 
and for our listeners to 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 hear uh will be shocking of course i believe that you know like you say perhaps these these forums will allow many people at least you know if it's just one person who watches this this podcast maybe that person can create a ripple effect you know who knows how how things can happen well you i mean we know that this happens because the the pod, the structure of the podcast world is such that some podcasters are now communicating with the entire planet and all they have is a is a studio and then two microphones and and maybe zoom or whatever uh uh it it's remarkable. It's truly remarkable. Uh, Joe Rogan is compared uh, sometimes to a uh, 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 big media company. Uh, Russell Brand is al almost in Rogan's category. Uh, Jordan Peterson. I mean, these people are communicating with millions of people uh, and are running circles around the big media system. So, of course, it's possible to win. The only question is whether uh, uh, the, the information we've been producing in this interview can, can make it into those channels uh, and reach millions of people fast enough and inspire them to, to communicate with still more people, right? Because uh, the, the key to unraveling, to, the key to unraveling the system is getting everybody to see it, you see? That's why the system manages reality because it doesn't want us to see it. But it's like the the the, the last scene, you know, the, the almost the last scene in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy pulls the curtain on on this mysterious figure that is behind the curtain. She, she hears some noises coming from behind the curtain. So she pulls the curtain and there's an old man there speaking into a microphone and pulling the levers for all the dazzling show that was distracting Dorothy. Uh, and then she realizes that that this old man pulling the levers and making this show and speaking in the microphone, that's the real Wizard of Oz. And the minute that happens, the entire system unravels because the system requires that you not see it in order to function properly. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, this happens. I'm hoping that, of course, you know, this is the second of many more interviews. The more we can to... to... Oh, so to keep, you know, sharing the truth and at least, you know, uh, raising more questions because after this conversation, I will 100%, you know, dig deeper into your articles in management of reality. And of course, a lot of things that I believe about, you know, the system itself. And yeah. we'll, we'll get there. Hopefully, uh, we're part of, of you know, <laughs> literally in, in, you know, in what we've discussed, it would be equal to well, saving the world. And, and you know the 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 well i mean that's that that be, uh, many people are working for that right this is not this is just one of many efforts uh so what what we need to do is join forces with all those other people who are or also working to save the world um we we the the method i recommend is people should try to prove me wrong mm -hmm. they should try to prove me wrong i think that's a that's really the best way to go about this Uh, and they will prove me wrong on some particulars for sure. Mm -hmm. That's guaranteed. I, I, I get some things wrong all the time. Uh, and and when, the, when I do get something wrong, it'll be great to see if, if people can, can uh, take the time to send me a message, maybe on Substack yep. uh, or, or, or to, to my email or whatever. Uh, but but uh, I want to know when I'm wrong, and then I'll modify the model until the model is maximally... It becomes even more predictive than it is right now. And should we discover that we need to throw this model out and get a new one? Fine. That's also progress. But the, but the way to get there is to try to prove me wrong uh, and, and, and see if how robust the model is. And then when you, if, if it turns out that you try to prove me wrong and you can't, uh, or you can't prove me wrong enough to really change the basic conclusions of the model, uh, well, then you know what you have to do. You have to you have to hurry up and defend the West because we're in trouble. Listen, Francisco, I'll, I'll make sure to to add all of your information as I did in the previous conversation, so people can reach out and also read your work and understand that Thanks. you know I I read your your most recent article, which is I, I we thoroughly explore it explore it in this conversation. You know how yeah. 
uh, and I almost like I, I, I dare to say like two thirds of, of your article is sources and citations and references and like all of those things are publicly available for everyone to see and to challenge. And so with that, right, example, exactly. Exactly. I'm, I'm honored to, to have you here and hopefully, you know, we'll the next one we can all of the conversation can be like on a good note, not just the end. <laughs> But well, we, we, can, we, we, we can end the, on a good note, Alex, because, uh, and I think that the good note is that we can win. We can win. We can win. So if, if everybody in the West suddenly understands that the whole point of anti-Semitism is to make them slaves, even if they're not Jews, right? That, that the entire point of the chess play of the anti-Semites that run the world is to make us all slaves. Then they will understand that fighting against anti-Semitism is the same thing as your own self-defense. Mm -hmm. And the minute they understand that, we will all be free because we won't be, they won't be able to manipulate it at the, us again. You see? So, so that's, I think the positive note and, and we can win. I mean, we, the podcasters, the great podcasters of this planet, yourself included, have demonstrated that uh, you, you have demonstrated that we can run circles around the big media and have real conversations that, that bring real information and analysis uh, for the consumption of Western citizenries uh, that can help us help make us all free. So that's the positive note. We can win. So let's, let's, uh, let's get to work. Francisco, thank you for joining me today. Okay. Thank you.